Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by... Emma Posey, the coalition's manager of American Moment. And we have a fantastic episode for you guys today. Uh, we have once again decided to go weird and wonderful by having Hal and Andrews on. Now, before I get to that, I want to encourage you guys to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything we have cooking besides this podcast, uh, including information about our fellowship program, which is about to wrap up. Um, Summit, a conference on American statecraft, AmCanon, sign up for the email list, and much, much more. You can also follow us on social media at AmMoment.org on most platforms. Um, but as to this episode, uh, when I say weird and wonderful, well, our guest today is Helen Andrews. And for those of you who don't pay close attention on social media, you'll know that she recently had a baby. And so she's been extremely busy and we've been wanting to have Helen on since the beginning. And so we've been patient, uh, hoping for uh, a good moment to come up where she'd be able to join us. But when Emma tracked her down at a recent ISI conference and pitched a potential episode to her, she couldn't resist. And so she very graciously made time for us today to come by our studios with her baby um, to talk about uh, all things feminism, Phyllis Schlafly, uh, the ERA, women's rights, uh, all motivated by this recent news story that the draft for women may be in the offing based on legislative proposals by the Biden administration and Congress. Now, rather than uh, try to get in between these two ladies as they get very rightly incensed about all of this, I just decided I would roll off the set, take care of Vladimir, and let them take it away. So um, I'm just going to go. <laughs> and so as we're getting started, I will read Helen's formal bio. Um, so Helen Andrews is a senior editor at the American Conservative and the author of Boomers, The Men and Women Who Promised Freedom and Delivered Disaster. Uh, she previously was the managing editor of the Washington Examiner magazine and a 2017-2018 Robert Novick Journalism Fellow. From 2012 to 2017, she lived in Sydney, Australia, working as a think tank researcher for the Center for Independent Studies. And before that, she was an associate editor, editor at the National Review. But beyond the formal bio, um, I have been a big fan of Helen Andrews um, for many years now, um, and it was solidified in her 2019 New York Times article, Where the Socially Conservative Women in This Fight, which we will get into in the episode today. But Helen, unlike many women that I know, has this incredible ability to be authentically herself, um, to be a strong social conservative, and also to be a total boss in her field, incredibly intelligent, um, an astute writer and thinker, um, and someone that I look up to a lot in this industry. So without further ado, let's go to our episode with Helen. Helen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So one of the questions that we like to ask our guests to get things started is to tell us a little bit about your background and how did you get to where you are today? Well, I ended up falling into journalism for lack of any other marketable skills. <laughs> uh, when I graduated from Yale in 2008, I bopped around various internships at great places like the American Spectator and the American Conservative and wound up as an associate editor at National Review where I was for a few years. Uh, then I took a bit of a career detour when I married an Australian and moved with him to Sydney, Australia, uh, and ended up working at a think tank there, the Center for Independent Studies. And so after spending the better part of a decade in Australia, I missed my home, so I had to come back. And so I returned not just to Washington, but to the American Conservative, where I am a senior editor now. Incredible, and have been doing wonderful work there, to say the least. So in 2019, you published an article with the New York Times called Where Are the Socially Conservative Women in This Fight? And that article is part of the reason why we wanted you on today to talk about the draft and other issues that are happening. Um, but before we get started um, talking about the rest of those issues for our listeners who may not have read the article in a few years, could you talk us through the basic premises of the article and what you were hoping to accomplish through it? The one line summary of the article is, why is there no modern day Phyllis Schlafly? Uh, she's a hero of mine. And the thing that I admire about her most is that when the Equal Rights Amendment was first proposed in the mid 1970s, 
everyone assumed it would pass quickly. It really seemed to everybody to be like the next step in the broader liberal civil rights revolution. Um, and dozens of states ratified it uh, in their state legislatures before Phyllis Schlafly decided to pick up and launch a campaign against it. Before she did that, no one was campaigning against the ERA. Mm -hmm. um, and so single-handedly, she prevented that mm -hmm. constitutional amendment from being passed. There aren't a lot of people that you can say that about, that sort of, in, if they hadn't existed, history would have turned out radically differently. But she mm -hmm. definitely qualifies. She, she single-handedly changed the course of history. And as I look around politics today, and as I looked around in 2019 when I was planning this article, I saw that there was another, there were other feminist or women's issues that were being debated where everybody seemed to be lining up on the same side in the same way that progressive Republicans lined up behind the ERA. Mm -hmm. Things like paid family leave, uh, things like paid family leave or, or, or greater government support for um, child care. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a general agreement that mm -hmm. families are in crisis and, and working families need a bit more help. The problem is that for a long time, all of the solutions being proposed by both parties, there was a bipartisan consensus that the way to fix the family crisis in America today is to make it easier for moms to work. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that from a policy perspective, that can end up tilting the playing field. So they say, if, if women want to go into the workforce, we'll give you lots of help, we'll subsidize you, we'll pay for your childcare. If you want to stay home and raise your own kids, you get nothing. And that is just fundamentally unjust. Mm -hmm. But the reason why that bipartisan consensus has been allowed to, to go on for so long is because the um, socially conservative women who prefer to stay home and raise their own kids don't really have a voice mm -hmm. in wonky circles. In, and it, it seemed to be exactly parallel to the 70s ERA fight. And in the same way that Phyllis Schlafly stepped up and was a voice for all of the women who were not terribly political because they were too busy raising their kids and, and being wonderfully fulfilled mothers, uh, there, there seemed to be a need, a crying need for somebody to fill that same role in, in the very important debates we're having today. I mean, I think we're, we're probably going to have a law passed on paid family leave or child care or something like that. Uh, in the very near future. So the, the time is now for that modern day Schlafly to step up and I didn't see anybody doing it. That's incredible. Um, so that hits on two really important parts of this. So when I'm thinking back to the time um, where she was speaking and working, it seems like the majority of women were probably rather conservative or at least shared a lot of her same fundamental premises when it comes to a woman's role in the marriage and in raising children and that being a primary good. And then today, when I'm looking around, I think that that would be at best a small minority. And even amongst those who are raised conservative, most young women today like tend towards a careerist mindset and model where children and marriage are being pushed off later and later, which your article gets on and so does every other major publication on marriage today. And so it seems like we're Whereas Phyllis was able to capitalize on a group of women that were not organized and didn't have a voice, where are the socially conservative women today? Like, do they exist? Is it a group that can be organized? Or are we at the point where we actually have to start with like maybe a liberal left leaning activist and start bringing them over to like, no, this is a proper understanding of femininity and womanhood. And this is how we should be thinking about the family, because I just I don't see that being well represented or even easy to find at this point. I'm, I'm so glad that you pointed out that most women were behind Phyllis Schlafly and her crusade. They actually did polling in the 1970s mm -hmm. on support for the ERA. And surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, it was pretty evenly split with men and women. Oh, that is, it, it was not that men opposed it and women favored it. It's, mm -hmm. They were both about evenly split. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, it, <laughs> she was, it, it was not, you know, lone Phyllis Schlafly against all the, the women. Yeah. Uh, she was just against the radical feminists, which it turned out were rather a minority. Um, <laughs> and that's actually, you have the same silent minority effect going on today. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at how people choose to structure their own families, mm -hmm. um, it's almost a, a bell curve situation in terms of women working. Women who are very poor tend to stay home and raise their own kids mm -hmm. because it's not economically worth it for them to go out into the workforce and then pay somebody to do their own childcare. They can't command a high enough wage for that to be make economic sense. 
and then women who are very wealthy, which means that women who can comfortably afford to stay home and raise their own kids choose to do so mm -hmm. because that's that's what women tend to prefer to do because nothing is more fulfilling than motherhood. It's mm -hmm. the women in the middle for mm -hmm. whom it's really, you know, they feel like they can't pull a middle class life together mm -hmm. economically without a second wage in the home and they feel like they're forced to go out and mm -hmm. work. Um, but polling suggests that a lot of people who have adopted that model would prefer something different, would prefer to stay home and raise their own children. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the group American Compass recently had a poll on this, uh, which reflected mm -hmm. that. Yes, yes, absolutely so. So then jumping off that, um, what does it mean to be a socially conservative woman today? Which is an incredibly loaded question, and I am really thankful I'm in this seat and not your seat right now. Um, but no one wants to have the courage to actually summarize it and not just make like really bad um, cliche statements about it, but like deeply and truly, like what does it actually look like to embody this and embody it well? Because I think people have a hunger and need for it. We're seeing a rise in a desire for traditionalism and a rejection of feminism in our generation. But I don't think people know where to go to even begin to articulate that. And there are very few women who are doing that and doing that well in the public sphere. Yeah, I don't have an answer to that question. <laughs> what does it mean to be a socialist? Because I mean, I, I, I try and do it every day, but I, maybe maybe I don't know exactly what it is that I'm doing. Um, I think that the fundamental message of every brand of feminism mm -hmm. in the 20th century was that there's something special and distinctive about women and mm -hmm. being a woman, mm -hmm. and that history for millennia up until the you know modernity, uh, that that perspective on the human experience had been neglected. Mm -hmm. I tend to think that that basic fundamental premise is correct. I, I, I think that that seems fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, but I think being a socially conservative woman means understanding that that neglected, essentially feminine perspective um, maybe does have a lot to do with not being a, a girl boss, but with being a, a mother. Um, mm -hmm. And that maybe those maternal instincts, mm -hmm. the very ones that the feminist movement now is trying to devalue, mm -hmm. might be where a lot of this um, previously neglected feminine wisdom lies. Yeah. That's a very good answer. And I think also highlights the important aspect is that you must take these principles and hold on to what is good and true and enduring and then find ways to manifest that and work that out in your own life, whether you are single, whether you're married, whether you're a mother and like what stage of life you actually find yourself in. Um, so you also wrote a book called Boomers <laughs> and yeah. it's uh, made quite an impact to say the least. And one of the things that has just anecdotally and thinking about these issues is I think back to the boomers and to people who raised them and there is so much opportunity and promise that when it comes to these questions, it seems like they're, and correct me if I'm wrong, like a general, a general consensus of like, the world is your oyster, you can do whatever you want, don't let anyone hold you back. Like thinking of Betty Friedan, for example, right? Like her mom, um, quit work at the newspaper as a journalist when she got married um, and they were raised like Jewish, rather affluent. Her dad worked, but her mother always told her like, whatever you do, get a good education and become a journalist and don't give up what you love like I had to. And there seems to be like this very like, I don't know, bitter or like I've missed out on something good narrative that came from that, that then with her generation was like, no, don't be limited by anything. And then in doing so failed to actually teach men and women, but particularly women, like what is actually good and unique about being a woman and how to do that well. Um, so in light of your book and your research um, and from what you've seen, like how, yeah, where have the boomers done well? Where have they failed? And like, how is that impacting our conversations today? Uh, I actually think that we are, I think your diagnosis of Friedan and her generation of feminists is exactly right. Mm -hmm. And I think we're probably, it's my hunch, we're going to see a similar backlash against feminism from Gen Z and younger. Um, one of the reasons why so many men were just kind of baffled mm -hmm. by Frida and era feminists is that they, as you say, put a lot of stock in having a career. Mm -hmm. um, they said, you know, you, you have been withholding from women this enormous source of meaning. You have, you have forced us to lead meaningless lives, raising children or some nonsense like that, when we could be working white collar jobs in offices. Um, and as, as you might expect, the men who worked these jobs said, you, you could come be a shoe salesman like me, but 
it's it's not a source of a whole lot of meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you are starting to see lots of women who have devoted their entire lives mm-hmm. to climbing up the career ladder. And because they were never told that there might be biological limitations to their window for having children, are now reaching their late 30s, realizing I'm not even married yet. I'm not going to have time to put the pieces together. I'm never going to have kids. Mm -hmm. I thought I could have it all. And now this most important piece of my life is just not going to come together for me. Um, And they're realizing that this career that they thought was so cool and interesting and stimulating, and this is even women who are lucky enough to have intellectually stimulating jobs. I mean, most women are not partners at fancy law firm, but even the ones that are, are thinking, it all just seems kind of empty now because I don't have a family. Um, And so, well, (laughs) it's not those women's children who are gonna learn lessons because they don't have any, Mm -hmm. but other women's children who are seeing their aunts and mother's friends Mm -hmm. falling into that trap are saying, wow, you know, (laughs) I, I need to not make the same mistakes. In the same way that Betty mm-hmm. Friedan or Gloria Steinem looked at her mother and said, I don't want to make those mistakes and end up like her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I am hopeful. And uh, we frequently joke that when we, uh, like our team goes places where the Gen Z representation. So people turn to us and be like, okay, guys, tell us more about the Gen Z perspective on this. And so um, at the American Compass Retreat a few weekends ago, we were in the room talking about social and cultural conservatism. And... I think I was like one of the only like younger quote unquote people in the room. And so they were like, okay, guys, like, do you actually talk about it? Because you have like cultural conservatism, which tends to focus on issues of immigration and second rights amendments. And then you have social conservatism, which cares a lot about questions of identity and sex and race. Um, And what's been so incredibly encouraging and interesting to see, um, and especially with my job taking tons of meetings with like 18 to 25 year olds, is how interested they are in family. And how with men and women alike, one of the like one of the topics they come back to and like the 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 point of all of their concern with it is I want to be able to have a family. I want to be able to afford my family and I want to have a meaningful life where I can actually invest in my children and in my family and also do work and things that I care about. Um, But like the linchpin of it is the family. So they care about the environment because they want a family that lasts. They care about the economy because they want to have a family they can support and the child allowance. And so it's been incredibly encouraging to see. And I think a narrative that like was largely lost even when I was coming up through high school and in college, um, yeah, that I've loved watching develop further. And hopefully that continues as we go. while we're yeah. on the topic of boomers, can I drop maybe my spiciest opinion? Yes, please. It's, it's maybe we not, love spicy opinions Actually, no, here. I can think of a half dozen ones I have that are spicier than this, but this is a pretty spicy one. Yeah. Um, I think college co-education was a massive mistake. Yes. Um, when I was uh, a young pundit in the late Obama years, one of the mm-hmm. top sort of social issues was the campus sexual assault crisis. Mm-hmm. And there were tons of people on the right making the very valid point that yes, there are there's an epidemic of sexual assault on campuses, hookup culture has gone completely wrong, Mm -hmm. but the answer is not to then throw out due process. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that this sort of Title IX crusade from the Obama administration was really, really misconceived. Um, But then conservatives had to stop and think, well, what is our solution? Mm -hmm. And you follow the steps back and you think, well, no, there's, there's really no way to make a bunch of hormonal, frequently drunk, teens and 20-somethings, men and women, living in the same building together, frequently in the same hallway, with no conceivable possible adult supervision around, there's no way to make that work. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, So trying to sort of fix it after the fact, once you have the kind of fallout uh, and the wreckage from that, as the Obama administration was trying to do, is the wrong way to go about it completely. Mm -hmm. And you realize, hang on a second, co-educational colleges at all, and certainly co-educational dormitories are a lot more recent than people think. Mm -hmm. Um, And that it it really, the reason that colleges uh, held off from co-educational residences for so long was worries about precisely this kind of situation. You know, they they didn't think that women shouldn't have education because it would take blood away from the uterus or something, uh, which was the classic. (laughs) Which was like actually the classic line, yeah. (laughs) I'm like, this is what I was taught in North Carolina public education, that that was the only anti-feminist reason for denying women to ever do anything was because you were worried it would take blood away from the uterus. Uh, when, no, they actually had pretty good right. rationale, right. which is that we don't want women to get assaulted by, you know, vulnerable women right. to get assaulted by right. men. Um, 
And that was something that the boomers did. Mm-hmm. Basically, the boomers, when they came in and flooded into the mm-hmm. uh, college market as students, mm-hmm. kind of blackmailed colleges. They said, we will not go to your school unless you offer us this co-educational amenity of mm-hmm. having lots of sex all the time. Uh, and universities figured, well, if, if other colleges are offering that, our admissions are going to drop to zero if we don't do it too. So we kind of all have to go along, which is a really stupid way to have decided something that is now massively deforming the kind of formative sexual experiences of everybody in America who goes to college, which is quickly Mm -hmm. becoming everybody in America. So in terms of things the boomers have done badly, that's an underappreciated one that's that's very high on the list. (laughs) It's so interesting too. I was reading a few of like the women's suffrages lines, um, or yeah, their lines with it, and I saw a sign. And apparently, one of like the great taglines was "Votes for women, chastity for men," <laughs> and it made the point that there is a very close relationship between the feminist movement and the sexual revolution. And whether you like it or not, every time there is a major progressive push, there is also a highly and generally negative sexual accompaniment accompaniment to that um so the sexual revolution and the promiscuity the rise of divorce and then now like having such a high level of assault on campuses and other areas where we've pushed so much for inequality and sameness between men and women that is now just leading to like an utter like degradation for sex and sexual intimacy um so then this brings us really nicely to the draft so last week uh the senate panel committee decided um took a vote and decided to include language where women would now be eligible for the draft. So all Americans ages 18 to 25 can now be required to serve their country. Um, No problem with that at all, right? Like we've already like women can serve in combat now. We've passed that law. And like if we truly want equality, um, then women must sign up for the draft. The ACLU actually had a very great line where they said that the last remaining stark example of sex discrimination is the fact that women are not required to sign up for the draft. Um, And there's a lot of questions on like, you know, what even is discrimination um, that come from that? But this is just this is massive. Like, think about the ERA and what was one of the main concerns that they had. It was that women would be required to sign up for the draft. And everyone was like, no, that's ridiculous. It's never going to happen. Um, We really just want them to have like equality in the system, regardless of the fact that we have the 14th and 19th Amendment and the Declaration of Independence that already covers that. Um, But now we're at the draft and there are conservatives like um, Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley, um, who have voted against it, and Chipoy especially, who are being very outspoken. Um, but on the whole, there's also a lot of conservatives and Republicans who are okay with it and either voted for it or don't want to take a big stance on it. Um, so first, I would love to hear your thoughts on the draft. But two, why is it that conservatives have the inability to show moral outrage at the female draft, aside from like a couple of token um, congressmen right now. Yeah, this is such a, a test issue for me. If you don't mm-hmm. understand what's wrong about drafting our daughters, then I, I, I don't even know what to say to you. Um, it's, it's almost, I'm, I'm almost unable to argue about it. Um, but yeah, it, it was an issue that Schlafly pointed to in her fight against the ERA and mm-hmm. was ridiculed for it. People mm-hmm. said, don't be absurd. Uh, This amendment is about equality for women. We're not going to end up drafting daughters. Uh, Very quickly, President Jimmy Carter said actually drafting women would be a really great idea, and he ordered his Defense Department to do it. Uh, He ended up being thwarted by Congress. Uh, And then there was a feminists litigated the question of drafting women, and it made it all the way to the Supreme Court in 1981. And the court said it was permissible to restrict the draft to men because of the combat issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, women were serving in the military, but not in combat roles. Uh, and so therefore you could, uh, that was sufficiently mm-hmm. uh, relevant to to allow them to, to restrict the draft to men. But that, as you say, was eliminated in Obama's second term. And so now we're in a state of legal ambiguity. Mm. So it's entirely possible that if a court case about drafting women made it to the Supreme Court now, Given that the combat exemption is no longer in place and the rationale for the 1981 Supreme Court case is no longer there, the court might well be forced to say, well, yep, by our own rationale, we we have to draft women. Mm -hmm. So it may be that Congress is seeking to to, um, preempt that. But yeah, no, it's it's 
absolutely horrible. I, my opinion on women in the military was changed by reading a book called Women in the Military, Flirting with Disaster by Brian Mitchell, uh, which came out in the 1990s and has a lot of a lot of really helpful information on how the issue has developed from World War II when lots of women did serve uh, mm -hmm. in the military positions and uh, until uh, about the 2000s. Yeah. And what's so interesting on the World War II point is I think that they actually considered in World War II extending a draft for women because they needed more volunteers. And it was floated around, but then there was a surge in volunteers such that they did not have to implement the draft, which one I think points out something very fundamental about women is like when something needs to get done, like they get it done. Like it's very practical, but like there was a problem. They floated the idea, people volunteered, there wasn't a need for it. And so now when we're talking about the draft, like think like thank the Lord, we are not like looking at imminent battle. Like we are not in a war right now that needs a draft. Um, and then, so then too, like we're talking about the draft, like it's simply for this like pseudo idea of equality. We're not responding to a need I, per se, um, but we are trying to make a very pointed statement about how we think about men and how we think about women in particular in our society. So if the draft was passed, can you talk us through some of the concerns and some of the intended or unintended consequences that could come from this? Let's see. Well, we don't even really have to speculate. We can just look at history. Um, in the 1970s, I think in 1978, mm -hmm. women in the Navy, uh, female sailors, sued the Navy um, in order to be allowed to uh, be have assignments on ship. Um, that is, women were allowed to serve in the Navy, but were not given assignments uh, on board ships uh, mm -hmm. during deployment. And a judge, a federal judge said, yep, that's, a, that's valid. The Navy has to do that now. And so the Navy then assigned women uh, to, a, I think it was a repair ship called the Vulcan, mm -hmm. which very quickly got the nickname, the Love Boat. <laughs> and there were... Wonderful. The, the Navy said one of the reasons why we don't want women on board is because we're worried they're going to get pregnant because it's a high stress situation and these things happen. Uh, and the Vulcan, in fact, saw three pregnancies before leaving dock. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that, that worry turned out to be valid. Uh, right. Um, the, one of the most depressing aspects of this debate is how the proponents of drafting women, mm -hmm. their side of the argument has just been characterized year after year by lying and propaganda hmm. in a way that's, that's really depressing. Um, the first woman to lead men into combat mm -hmm. um, was a, a, an army captain named Linda Bray in the invasion of Panama in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a case where <laughs> the first news reports said that Captain Bray had heroically led her men through a three hour firefight to capture a heavily defended Panamanian army dog kennel. And it very quickly became clear that it had not been a three hour firefight. She had been miles away during most of the heavy fighting um, and that the, the sort of propaganda version of heroic woman leads men into battle mm -hmm. had been for political purposes only mm -hmm. uh, as Captain Bray herself later confirmed. And mm -hmm. Captain Bray, who's, who's an, a thoroughly admirable person, I have no problem with Linda Bray, mm -hmm. uh, but she was eventually discharged from the army because she shattered her legs because she was carrying too heavy a weight, which is one of the fundamental physiological differences between men and women mm -hmm. that makes women maybe less suited. They just can't carry as much, which is a thing that if you're a soldier, you have to do. Um, so yeah, don't, that's um, mm. a, a predictable end to subjecting women to uh, the burden of male service in that way. Yeah, that's so good. So then now, like even if you're able to overcome the obvious biological differences, um, and, you know, Biden's birthing persons are somehow <laughs> kept from becoming pregnant during this time. Um, one, you still, like you said, run into this issue where, like, if you were on the battlefield and your comrade falls, like, if he's a 250 pound man, regardless of how strong and capable you are, like, as a woman, do you have the strength to pull him and all of his weight back to safety? Or do you now bear this burden where you realize like you have left a man behind because you were physically not strong enough to carry him in a in like in a situation where like another man potentially would be. Um, but even if like all of those concerns were taken away, um, I think one thing that's frustrating about the conservative argument about 
femininity um, and gender in general is that they tend to rely on very materialistic um, concerns. And so it's simply based on obvious biological differences. But I think when we're talking about gender and sex, we also are talking about something that is a deeply spiritual and innate reality that goes that is manifested through our biology, but goes so far beyond that. And so how would you think through this issue even beyond just like the biological limitations, but thinking through like how like who a woman is, how she thinks and why being in combat is maybe not like the best <laughs> position to put like our daughters in as yeah, as we're saying. Yeah, um, one of the most important court cases, uh, not just involving women in the military, but involving women in civil rights law, period, hmm. is United States versus Virginia, the VMI case, Virginia Military Institute. Um, and this was a, a lawsuit against the, the the West Point of the South, if you don't know about VMI, and General Marshall went there. Uh, it's, it's a huge centuries-long storied history. It's a, a beloved Virginia institution. Mm -hmm. And it was sued by the U.S. Justice Department to force it to admit women mm -hmm. uh, and eventually made it to the Supreme Court in 1996 and the court ruled for the Justice Department and, and therefore commanded that VMI had to admit women. Um, and one of the, well, the fundamental schizophrenia at the heart of all uh, sex-based civil rights law is that the, the, the bedrock rule is that you cannot take sex into account if sex is irrelevant. But that really just kicks the issue kind of up a level because you say, well, what does it mean for it to be relevant or not? Um, for example, when courts struck down height and weight requirements in police departments in the 1970s, the way the court cases would go is that, you know, uh, the, the heads of these police departments in San Francisco or, or other U.S. cities would say, I've been doing this job for 30 years and I'm telling you the kinds of things a beat cop has to do are things that women due to physiological constraints, are generally not as able to do. Um, so these height and weight requirements, even if they disproportionately disqualify women, that is not, don't throw them out. I'm telling you, my expertise is telling you <laughs> these, they're, they're important, they're there for a reason. And then the feminist groups that were bringing the suit would say, well, that's, that's not evidence, that's just prejudice. Do you have a study? bring me a study that shows women are less able or less qualified to be cops because we, the feminists, have a whole ream of, of studies showing that women are equally qualified. And if you actually drill down and, and look at those studies very frequently, what it is is they would poll. They would get a guy <laughs> with a clipboard to go on the street and ask people, would you respect a cop any less if that cop were a woman? Mm -hmm. And of course, they would say, well, 80% of people say, of course not. No, I would respect the cop equally. You say, well, that doesn't really have any bearing on the material question of whether you can wrangle an angry drunk mm -hmm. if you're five foot one and 105 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, but so this, this question of what kinds of evidence qualify mm -hmm. if you're trying to substantiate the claim that in this case, sex actually is relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, and in VMI, you had tons of alumni and former staffers at the school saying, mm -hmm. no, really, we have this thing called the rat line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is highly abusive. <laughs> it is basically a form of institutionalized hazing. Uh, it's it's just the side of torture, and we do it to all of our all of our freshmen, all Great. of our plebs, um, and it's a VMI institution. We would not mm -hmm. be the same place that we are without mm -hmm. it. And one of their claims was that at VMI, even if women could make it through the rat line and could meet all the physical qualifications, here mm -hmm. at VMI we are trying to create gentlemen, mm -hmm. even Southern gentlemen. Right. And an important part of that is chivalry. So if men at VMI are forced to torture female freshmen in the rat line, that is contrary to the spirit of chivalry that we are trying to cultivate. Um, and actually in, in scenarios where they have looked at mixed sex units, the problem very frequently is not that women are not up to the job, it's the men around their female colleague go out of their way to make things easier for her because they have a spirit of chivalry. And, you know, do, do we really want to get rid of that? I, I kind of don't. Yes, 100 percent. And then when you're thinking about combat, do you really want to put men in a situation where they are trying to stay so focused on the battle and the orders that they're given while also having that same instinct to care and protect for their female comrades? 
And so either you have that and it undermines the efficiency of a unit or you don't have that. And like you said, like, is that really the reality that we want to create? Um, and like on the one hand, I'm just very unimpressed, right? You have like Plato's Republic book five. He literally does a thought experiment thousands of years ago where he's like, OK, let's have an equal society. Men and women are totally equal and therefore the same. Let's put men and women in combat. OK, let's now look at like these equal men and women, maybe these equal men and women, the men should maybe do more of the fighting. And, you know, this is like Greek culture, so they're like fighting naked. And then maybe like the women should do this sort of equal combat over here. And like maybe everyone is equal, but maybe these men and women should equally procreate and these men and women should like equally not procreate and maybe this is the sort of society we want and so it goes through like a 30 page chapter and by the end of it you end up in a more traditional society where men step up into the roles of combat and protecting their homeland and women are those who are nurturing and sustaining the household um and advocating and fighting like within that realm as well um and so there's that you have alex de tocqueville just 200 years ago writing about how the concern with democracy is that it falls into a sameness and that we lose any sort of distinction between the sexes and then our society crumbles with it so on the one hand like we've been here before like we've talked about it for thousands of years we've seen this play out it's unimpressive on the other side of things i am just deeply deeply enraged that people would have the audacity to suggest this. You have a feminist movement that begins under the pretenses of we want to give women a choice. So no longer do you feel like you have to like get married as soon as possible and have children. That's all that you do. And instead, we want to open up a world where you can have a career and you can pursue other interests, which, by the way, like Betty Friedan did her entire time. And so did Phyllis Schlafly. And so did like all of these other women. Like it wasn't off limits to them. Uh, to begin with and yet continued pushing for this thing and so now we've reached a point where like you don't have a choice it's like you become a career woman and if you're not a career woman then somehow you've done things less than and you can be a stay-at-home mom but like it's kind of a junior role if you're not like actually pursuing a career first and foremost and so then we've put women in a position where like we continue to undermine any sort of like cultural values that like set them apart and treat them differently right like this is phil's entire line women have special privileges in society and the era actually hurts you because it takes those away when it comes to the family protection when it comes to abortion when it comes to things like the draft and so now all of a sudden like you've put women through the ringer and these are typically like more elite lines right and like if elite circles have the freedom and have the affluency to fight for this, and then you look at like the lower class um, and like middle and working class Americans, then marriage rates are falling. Um, the rise of children being born out of wedlock is insanely high. And so all of a sudden, these decisions we've made in very like elitist feminist circles are just directly hurting our middle and working class in America. And they don't have any sort of yeah, they don't have like any sort of now support and like social structure that like tells them like yeah, that helps form and shape them in a way that they should go. And then on top of that, we would suggest a draft and you're like, okay, women, in case you're not already like doing enough, you're not already like on SSRIs, you're not already like very unhappy, like statistically way more unhappy than we were in the 70s. You're not already trying to like balance a career and full-time marriage, but also like, yeah, we like, we need you to go fight in a war too. That makes perfect sense to me. And it's just so infuriating, one, that that would even be suggested as a good thing. And two, that more people aren't enraged by it. And that conservatives are like, this seems fair. We do want equality between the sexes. Therefore, we should send our daughters to war, which is quite literally what they are saying. And if they think that passing this is just going to be a benign like piece of paper sense of equality, like absolutely false. Like that is not what's going to happen. There will be a reason uh, one day that the draft is called. And the next thing you know, you have mothers of small children going off to war and you have fathers staying behind or you have mothers and fathers being drafted um, or like you just you never know. Um, and it's just so, yeah, so incredibly beyond me that this is something that we would even consider as potentially being good and just in society. No, I, while, while you were talking about uh, feminism of today being elite driven, I looked up one of my favorite quotes from the debate over the ERA, because one of the few uh, sort of explicitly sex differentiated laws on the books in most states at that time um, were workplace protections. Uh, there were special things. Women couldn't work as many hours as men. You couldn't have, you know, you had to pay them extra for overtime, things like that. And the Federation of Business and Professional Women said in their testimony, the days of sweatshops and intolerable working conditions are largely past. The notion that women are frail and require special protection 
is obsolete. And in order to rebut that sort of rather uh, elitist notion, um, the anti-ERA side brought in blue collar mm -hmm. women <laughs> to say, well, actually, no, I, I work with my body and I can tell you there are things, men are, men are still stronger and there are still lots and lots of jobs where that's highly relevant. Mm -hmm. This is a, a consistent theme in all of feminism. This, every generation of feminists always thinks that the golden age of women has begun because we have finally defeated nature. Science has finally advanced to the point where we, we are no longer constrained by biology. You had, uh, for example, lots and lots of women saying, well, now that the pill exists or now that abortion is widespread, we need no longer be constrained by the fact that only women can get pregnant and men can't because we, we never have to get pregnant involuntarily. Um, and well, there are lots of problems with that, but one of the things that millennial feminists are quickly discovering is that while we've gotten very good at not having children when we don't want them, we have not gotten any better about having children when we've decided that we do want them, um, which is why you actually see a, a fad now in Silicon Valley uh, of lots of women putting money into fertility research because they've decided, hang on a second, I'm a, a, a highly accomplished meritocrat. I've done everything in my life I've put my mind to. Uh, I got into Harvard. I got a job at Google. I'm you know, one of the 100 most accomplished women in the world right now. And you're telling me that I can't just use science to make it happen to have a baby now that I'm 39 years old? Are you, t are you really telling me nature is just so much more powerful than any <laughs> clever thing I can come up with? And that's, mm -hmm. well, that's a, a classic human story. The Greeks called it hubris. And it comes up again and again and again. But no, there's this idea that we, well, we're, we're much more technologically advanced now. We're not in an age when women are still working on farms or whatever. No, it's, you know, feminism's day has come thanks mm -hmm. to science. They always think that and nature always teaches them, <laughs> teaches them better. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, just 100% <laughs> to that, to all of that. Um, yeah, so going back to yeah and like and yeah that's just like and that comes down like time and time again i think one um whether you're a christian or not like you can read the bible like jordan peterson does and think about it as like a great example of myth or you can read it as like an inspired text but either way i think it's relevant and so like think back to the garden you have genesis you have god creating the world you have god creating man when he creates man he said it is not good and that's the first time that god says that something is not good and it's not good that man should be alone so he's going to create eve a helpmate um one who is necessary for the completion of like their like mission as humans and like for the fulfillment of what it means to be human and so then you have chapter three in genesis and the serpent lucifer comes on the scene and one it's really interesting that like lucifer doesn't talk to adam he doesn't talk to any other creatures he goes to eve first and so if you want to point like back to the like original roots of like war on women like it literally just starts here <laughs> And the very first question that is asked in all of scripture comes from the serpent. And the serpent looks and says to Eve, did God really say? And in that line, you have the entire downfall and like lie of every like feminist movement since then. And I think it encapsulates this idea that like there's this fear I think maybe especially as a woman, maybe not, I can only speak, you know, as a woman, that like you are missing out on something and that something good is being withheld from you. So if you were not in combat, something good is being withheld from you and you should be able to like prove your own alongside men, even though it is a horrific thing. It is not an opportunity. It is the worst responsibility that no one wants, which like as a side note is probably why they'll repeal the draft altogether in the face of like having to put women in it, which... It's a bit cowardly, but that's probably where we're going to go. Um, and then like the same for like every feminist line that like what you have and what you have been given or even like the biology of like, you should probably like get married young and have children now and like pursue career and good things the way that you want to later on as you go. And like, maybe that's a good way to go about it. And maybe that does help overcome a lot of these biological um, limitations that we just literally live within. But it's this fear that we are missing out on something. Um, and what's also really interesting is I share this like deep frustration of like presenting women in this like, oh, they're like soft and they're delicate and they're meant for like lovely things and floating around because like, I mean, 
that's not the sort of woman I am. And I don't <laughs> think that's the sort of woman a lot of people actually are. Um, and in, instead, like we've put this like intention with like being incredibly intelligent and driven and doing good things. And what's really interesting is looking through scripture, like you see women like constantly like in battle in one form or another. And you see women using the skills and the perspective and like, yeah, like the abilities that they have in very unique ways that no one else could accomplish. And so like, for example, deception when a woman is like on a good task is never condemned in scripture. Like you have Rahab who like lies to the king in order to protect the spies, never condemned. She's actually given one of the highest places in scripture. You have Jael literally like seducing a man into a tent saying like look i have more milk for you you should lay down take a nap i'll be here for you and then drives a spike through his head when he falls asleep and you have other like countless examples of women like dropping heavy stones and like killing like the king or the like most fierce like battle like warrior in battle and like being decisive like parts of that and i think it just does a great disservice to women to say like the only way to be strong the only way to be effective is to like look in this very like masculine role and so like therefore to be like a strong like empowered liberated woman like you should look masculine when we have like countless examples in scripture alone and throughout all of history of women actually like stepping into that in like a way that is uniquely good um and highly effective and essential for society um and that's like my tangent rant um I, yeah i know um if you read books about the era fight you will find mm -hmm. that they are almost always written by feminists uh, and so their yeah. treatment of the Schlafly side is usually a bit kind of befuddled. And I yeah. can't imagine why they did this. And one of my favorite examples is one of them, I forget which one, uh, went home to her husband and said, you know, honey, I really feel strongly about this issue, but it's going to take a little bit of time away from my family to go and pursue this and join Phyllis in her crusade. Do you think this is okay for me to do this? And he said, well, honey, perhaps like Queen Esther, <laughs> you were brought to the kingdom for, for just such a time as this. And and the historian who recounts that anecdote is just so baffled. Like, they they believe in scripture, but for feminist reasons, does not compute. Yep. Uh, but yeah, no, it's 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 a lovely, a lovely little moment. I can just, yeah. I can visualize that happening in somebody's kitchen. It's right? really nice. <laughs> right? It's incredible. It's just, yeah, absolutely incredible, which is like, reminds me of like one of my favorite lines from Phyllis is that every time she would um, begin a speech, she would start the speech with, I would first of all like to thank my husband for giving me the permission to be here tonight. <laughs> And then she would like laugh and be like, it really makes the liberals mad when I say this. And it was just like the greatest thing I've ever read. You know, the the FX miniseries, Mrs. Mm -hmm. America, where they had mm -hmm. Kate Blanchett play Phyllis Schlafly, was actually pretty good. It mm -hmm. was kind of like Mad Men, you know, it was very glamorous and, and um, oh gosh, is it Terry Ullman who played Betty Friedan was great, mm -hmm. was fantastic. But the one thing that they missed is that Phyllis had a wonderful sense of humor. <laughs> Right? She was hilarious. Right? She was not this Kate Blanchett ice queen. No, mm -hmm. she was she was funny. Yes. She was really funny. Yes. Very funny, very pithy, very feisty. Um, yeah, like absolutely incredible. Uh yeah. So yeah, go through. What are some of your favorite things about Phyllis? Like she, because of the series Mrs. America, um, which they should have just done MS America because she was really against the misses. Um, that was just like a missed opportunity on their part. What are, what are some of your favorite things about her and favorite things that she's done and like the legacy that she has imparted to us? Let's see. Um, I love that she worked at AEI before it was even AEI, mm -hmm. back when it was the American Enterprise Association, mm -hmm. um, that she had a degree from Radcliffe, that she fed her children uh, wheat meal, <laughs> uh, that kind of porridge. Yeah. And she told them, you know, the, the, the men who conquered the Roman Empire <laughs> ate this for breakfast every day, so it's good enough for you, uh, which is just delightful. It's incredible. Um, and during World War II, mm -hmm. she worked in a munitions factory, and one of her jobs was testing ballistics. So you must imagine young 20-something Phyllis in a giant munitions factory firing off massive World War II era guns. Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly her opposition to drafting women <laughs> was not due to any reactionary refusal to believe that men, that women can fire big guns. She had yeah. personal experience <laughs> that in fact they could. That's incredible. I, she was such a slight figure. Like the mental picture is just really funny in like the best possible way. Like she was a total, total boss. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. And I think 
So one of the things that is really interesting, so both Phyllis and Betty, right, like raised in the same time. So Betty comes from a background, like I mentioned earlier, she was raised Jewish. Her father was affluent. Her mother did quit work, whether she was forced to or chose to, I'm not really sure, um, and was raised with like a really great education. On the other side, you have Phyllis, who was raised staunchly Roman Catholic. Um, her father lost his job um, after like 20 something years at a factory, went through a season of like very serious depression. And also like when you're 51 trying to be rehired for a job that's very manual, like it's really hard to get a job. Um, so like, let's just talk about like working class America and like all of the ways that like factories and like that's just gone very poorly. Um, but her mother in response to that started working two jobs to take care of them. But what's most incredible about that is that um, her mother had about like a 45 minute hour commute to work every day. And so on her way to and from work, she wrote a history of St. Louis. <laughs> so she literally was like just like writing her book. Um, and then when they would come home at night, cook dinner, have dinner as a family, and then like uh, the girls would be doing homework, her mom would be working on her book. And then I think of like, then Betty, her mom telling her like, no, like never let anyone take your career away. Like never let them do this thing. You need to fight for this education. And I think one of the most important things um, in this conversation is how are we talking about what it means to be a woman and what it means to be truly feminine? Um, to one another to ourselves and then like one day to our daughters um because like the way that these two mothers presented this like led to drastically different women and drastically different outcomes in the era and anti-era fight also as an interesting side note one of phyllis's sons and one of betty's sons ended up in the same um, phd program under the same advisor at berkeley years later I which mean, is just like so like who would have thought that's a weird small world kind yeah, of thing but like I had no idea. very similar women except for like religious differences and then like mainly like the way that their mothers talked about these issues um and so like it's something that i've felt very challenged as like thinking about like one day having children um and like i was totally a tomboy growing up and definitely went through phases of like i can do everything a boy can do like watch i can pick up this heavy load i can do it better than you look at me and then coming to a place of like okay maybe there's like a fuller more holistic way of thinking about what it means to be a strong woman and then being very challenged with like okay like how would i talk to my daughters about this sort of thing how would i present this in a way that actually taps into who they are fully and empowers them and doesn't create a weird complex on one side or the other um, and so, you know, you have been thinking about these issues um, and you are a mother um, to a wonderful son. And so how would you think through this and how would you think about talking about these issues and the idea of being feminine to your children and to the generation that's coming up um, with me and below me? You know, I was I was exactly the same way, such a tomboy, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then in my 20s, I would say I'm not going to order apple teenies. I'm going to you know, give me whiskey mm -hmm. straight. Make it a double. Yes. Yeah. And then I realized I actually really like apple teenies. <laughs> so now I, I don't have a problem ordering ordering a girly drink. That's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, no longer self-conscious about that. Um, every great work of art, mm -hmm. from the Epic of Gilgamesh to about 1960, mm -hmm. is full of a, a rich depiction of men and women and the ways that they're different. Mm -hmm. So it was only by means of a deliberate forgetting, mm -hmm. a deliberate obscuring of our wonderful, you know, civilizational heritage that we arrived at a point where people might grow up and think that men and women are different. Um, so it's really all there waiting to be discovered. Mm -hmm. um, although I'm, I'm not sure you even have to learn it one of the most formative experiences for me in terms of appreciating that men and women are, are really are different was teaching preschool. Oh, very which was, interesting. That was my kind of day job mm -hmm. when I was right out of college and hoping to make it as a writer. I would write in the evenings, <laughs> but I would pay rent mm -hmm. by working uh, at, at, at a preschool. And it was so incredible to me to observe how sex differences were visible even then. Uh, and it was more than that. Uh, I was there for uh, uh, about a year and a half, and halfway through my time there, mm -hmm. we went from having a, by coincidence, all-male class, mm -hmm. um, so about six young boys, mm -hmm. about four years old, and then halfway through, we enrolled one girl, <laughs> and the dynamic changed immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think these guys haven't even gone through puberty yet, but the men just started acting, trying to impress her, they started acting a lot dumber. 
Um, the IQ in the room dropped <laughs> about 15 points as yep. soon as a woman showed up. Yep. Um, but it just completely changed. There were jealousies, and mm -hmm. whereas before it had been kind of a, a nice camaraderie. Mm -hmm. um, and we eventually found our way to a new social dynamic that worked. Mm -hmm. It helped a lot when a second girl enrolled. <laughs> Having yeah. just one girl was hugely problematic, yeah. but you know these are these are kids who haven't have hardly been taught anything mm -hmm. yet. This is all just coming from instinct, mm -hmm. and it makes such a huge difference. Mm -hmm. That was when I thought maybe these feminists <laughs> have been lying to me, <laughs> and maybe there's something good to be found even in that. Which is what's so interesting. Um, I read a study that was or someone talking about how when men when it's an all men situation, so like the Boy Scouts before girls were able to enter um which as a side note like when i was in middle school all of my guy friends because i had a lot of guy friends and lots of just like male cousins um they were all in boy scouts and i was so outraged as a middle schooler that like i wasn't allowed to join boy scouts because i was like i don't want to sell popcorn and like braid things i, I want to go in the woods yeah which i did and i want to <laughs> start fires and maybe i can start fires better than you so why can't i be in here if i'm like more capable um and you know we slowly but surely grew out of that one maybe like two years ago um but it's fine and but but thinking about it, like they talk about how when men, when it's all men, all boys, there is a hierarchy that is established where even the men who are not as strong, um, maybe have more of a beta personality or like don't have like whatever, yeah, like distinctive skills that like maybe would make them top of the pack, still find a place in the pack where they are taken care of. There's a clear hierarchy and an understanding. The moment, like you said, that a female enters the picture, it just is completely obliterated. And instead, all men are vying for the attention of a single person. And then now the men that they were taking care of in this like clear hierarchy are now their enemies. And so now there is undermining, there is cutting them down, and there's finding ways of like showing that you were better. And if you are stronger or you are taller or like whatever skills that you have, then like every other man's left at a really solid disadvantage. Um, and just take that back to combat. Like once again, like putting that like in a sphere where you're training together, where you were preparing to go into battle together, like what does that do just to the like physiological and psychological like development of men going into war development of men, even like you were talking about earlier, like in education, um, maybe like having classes where it's only men and only women at certain times, like might actually help us grow and learn a lot more than we're willing to give ourselves credit for now. Um, so yeah, so yeah, just totally, totally true and good point there. Um, so then thinking about it now, how should, um, yeah, how do I want to word this? Why is it that conservatives are so shy about saying these things? Because I have an inkling that most people believe this and most people who have children and J.D. Vance has a great speech about this that is blowing up the airways <laughs> about how uh, the majority of leaders on the left are people who don't have children. And they might be married, but they were probably married later in life. Um, and they don't have children. And like that is a huge difference when it comes to thinking about the future of a nation and like your investment in the future of a nation compared to a lot of like conservatives and people on the right who typically have more children. Like AEI released a study last week where people who vote or identify as Republican have 10% more children <laughs> than those on the other side at like any demographic level. Um, and it makes sense. So if this is the case, if like people on the right seem to really value like children and they value family, then why are they hesitant and why are they shy about saying these things, especially in the face of controversies like the draft? Um, it's exactly the same dynamic that was operating in the 1970s. Mm. Um, I think a, a big part of it is that Republicans are self-conscious and worried about being reactionary or retrograde. So they think, oh, if we only go out of our way to appease feminists on this or that issue, then then they'll, they'll leave us alone and stop calling us cavemen, mm -hmm. um, which I, I have to assure them will never happen. You, you will never be far enough left to make them stop calling you sexist. Yeah. Um, so just give up, give up that dream right now. Yeah. Um, I wonder if maybe also another factor, and this also was operating in the 70s, is that if you're, if you're working in an office environment, many of the women that are there are career-minded types and feminist mm -hmm. types. And so you, you, if you're a chivalrous man, you don't want to say anything that's going to alienate or, or seem to disparage mm -hmm. the women in your office because they, they do good work for you and you don't want to make them feel bad. Uh, but of course, that means that all of the women who you would be standing up for who don't want to be drafted, 
um, you you know you you don't see them every day in the office, and so you don't think about your duty to to stand up for them. I understand that it can be difficult if you're sitting you know across a table from a woman who has served in the military. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're saying don't draft our daughters. Does, does that mean I'm telling her she's bad at her job? You know, and you, I understand not wanting to say that because, of course, many of these women are, are really very excellent at their jobs. Um, but it's it's the women who aren't in the room, who aren't coming in from the Pentagon in their dress blues or whatever, who you who you need to stand up for, but who it's very easy, especially if you're a politician, to, to forget. Yeah. And the core of the anti-ERA movement and a lot of movements um, in the past has been through grassroots conservatism. And it's been um, local communities and statewide movements that have really stood up and advocated for these women who you aren't seeing day to day. And so as um, as we were just sort of drawing this episode to a close, um, what would you say what can average daily Americans in their communities, in their homes, um, or people who work on the Hill but want to be very conscientious of like grassroots movements and these people that you don't see day to day, um, what does it look like then to, yeah, what does it look like to make these movements on a grassroots level, like in your communities? What are the conversations we should be having? What should the normal Americans be doing who aren't here in DC um, and seeing this day to day? Uh, well, the great thing about social media, which has in almost every other respect been a disaster for humanity, uh, is that it makes it a, a, a lot easier to get to get your opinions in front of people in power. Um, so just ex- express your common sense opinion. Don't let anybody on Twitter or Facebook tell you that you're an idiot. Uh, if, if you really believe that it's a, a mistake to draft women, say so. Because uh, thanks to the wonderful power of the internet, people will be listening. Absolutely. And for people who are in Congress, um, don't approve any version of it that has the female <laughs> draft. And should the NDAA still push for it, cut their funding and don't let it go through. <laughs> Use the power of the purse like you have to make this effective and good. Um, yeah. So that, that's what Congress did when Jimmy Carter tried to push this through in the 70s. So just do that same thing again. Incredible. We, we have a playbook for this. <laughs> you don't even have to be original. You just have to like look back on history and do it again. Um, and if it worked in the 70s, maybe just maybe it can work here in the 21st century too. Um, but Helen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. This was great. So I wish that I'd been able to stay and watch that entire episode, but uh, the second they got started, Vladimir started fussing, so I took him upstairs and made sure that he was doing okay uh, for the hour or so that they taped. Emma, what did you guys talk about? Yeah, so we had a episode chock full of content, um, everything from Phyllis Schlafly to the ERA um, and some of the really poignant lines that the anti-ERA um, advocates would use during the 60s and 70s, but then particularly tying it into our understanding of feminism today. So we had a really great conversation thinking about the generation of the boomers, thinking about like antiquity itself and the ways that there are enduring truths that our generation needs to hear and continue continually needs to be reminded of when it comes to this these questions of femininity and what does it mean to be a woman um, and how do we engage in our political discourse today now how angry are unhappy cat ladies going to get with the content of this episode if we're lucky they'll get really angry. <laughs> like if this was a good episode we'll get some hate mail from it maybe yeah helen is is a singularly talented person um been an admirer of her for a long time as well and and, uh, really excited that we were able to tape this episode. I think that, you know, it's it's incredible, right? Because conservatives have been fighting these social issues, specifically with regards to feminism and third wave feminism for so long. And it seems like all it takes is one opportunity where conservatives do not have any political power. And suddenly the progressive left is willing to barrel full steam ahead mm-hmm. through every single barrier that we've erected. And this, this women's draft thing is no different. I mean, it is it speaks to a particularly demented ruling class that, you know, what they would decide to do with political power in a moment of great strife in this country is to send women to 
go die abroad so that you can teach critical theory to Pashtuni tribeswomen. I mean, it's just utterly ridiculous and uh, it makes me mad. I can't imagine how angry it makes you. So incredibly angry. And like off that too, like women um, have historically been the ones who protect who protect and continue um, a strong understanding of tradition and society. And if you send all of the women away, then there is no foundational historical route to anything greater than oneself past your generation. Um, well, and the thing about this is that modern society has lost any of these social constraints that could direct it to oppose something like the women's draft. So it's logically consistent with the status quo in society we see now. Um, but with any classical understanding of complementarity, the role of men and women in society, right. it, it obviously falls apart. Right. But I mean, I don't know. How, what would you say to the argument that, look, we're so far gone already. If we're really going to play this equality game, then we may as well you know, have women be drafted. I don't think we are that far gone. So conservatives have this line that, that they always use, that they want a specific bill to fit a specific ill. So when the ERA was initially proposed, that was the line that people said. Like instead of like a sweeping regulation, we should actually address if there are moments of discrimination, which as Phyllis Schlafly said, she was like, the only law I can think of is a law in South Dakota that required a woman to get her husband's permission before making wine in their basement. <laughs> and she was like, but that's the only law. And she had a like she had a law degree, like she has studied this and she knows. And she was like, that is the only one I can think of. And yet um, conservatives have held that line. But who has capitalized on that line? That has been the liberal progressive ruling elite. Every single thing that the ERA said would happen if it was that people who like were counter to the ERA said would happen has come to pass. Um, you have abortion rights. You have women not only allowed in combat, but now being considered for the draft. Um, you have laws protecting women and children slowly being undermined in society. And so when I think of that, like one, like we might have won the battle with the ERA, but we are so far from winning the overall war. But I don't th think that we are too far gone. Um, you can let things play out to their inevitable conclusion, but we have a responsibility as citizens, as Christians, as women and men in the United States to continue holding on to those values that are enduring and true that I think the majority of Americans actually hold that just might not be represented in our elite ruling class and in like our popular media today. But we are so far from actually having lost the battle and instead I think this is waking people up to hold on to and continue protecting that which is good true and beautiful that has endured for millennia I would I would drop this mic but the producers would shoot me in the head so uh, without further ado <laughs> we will close the episode for today uh, please make sure to go onto Apple podcasts or whatever platform you get your podcasts on and rate and review us and if you review uh, if you write a review and include a question in it and it, as long as it's five stars we'll gladly answer it on the show if you don't feel like putting it in the review itself you can just send a screenshot of your five star review to podcast at americanmoment.org with your question and we'll answer it from there um, share this episode around i have a feeling that it's going to be one that's going to really resonate uh, share it on twitter facebook social media and uh, we'll see you guys next week moment of truth is an american moment studios production filmed at the conservative partnership center our podcast is produced and edited by jake mercier and jared cummings our intro music is a minor struggle by ryan serenich don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.